just want to make sure everything was cleared. So thank you all for your patience. So thank you for everybody who's watching both virtually and today in the live audience. I'm your host, Kenneth McNulty, part of AFRL Public Affairs, and I am so excited to present to you today AFRL Inspire. Let's see a round of applause. Get excited. Woo! So thank you all again for being here today. We have a lineup of amazing speakers that we've been anxiously waiting to show you for over a year's time. So again, it's going to be cool stuff. But before that, about a little over a year ago, March 2020, the pandemic started for many of us. And it was difficult. We had to adapt, go work from home, set up teleworking options, and more. But AFRL, for those of you watching and those in the audience, you did an amazing job showing our resilience and our strength to persevere to show that we could rise to the challenge and still execute our mission as one. So you should all be very proud of what you've done. And many of us may have felt disconnected, may have felt away from our workspace, our leadership, and our colleagues. But through Zoom calls and events like this, we feel more connected and feel stronger for it. And back in that time, we had to make the difficult decision to postpone AFRL Inspire 2020. But we knew it was the right one. And given the right time, we could weather the storm and make this all happen, which is why I'm able to do this live for you today. Now, adhering to COVID-19 restrictions, we made sure we had a special event planned, this, with some people here live and many of you watching online to ensure that we made sure that safety standards were adhered to. But due to that, we we're able to be here as one AFRL and truly represent what we all stand for. With that being said, we have a lineup of eight amazing speakers today, people I think you're really going to enjoy. Four of them coming live here from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and four pre-recorded, coming from places like Edwards Air Force Base in California, Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, and more. And to give a sneak peek as to who you're going to hear, we have people like a former test pilot, a confined space specialist, a combustion researcher, and so much more. So again, get excited. Now, to make sure if you want to take part of the conversation online, if you're posting videos, pictures, or even your thoughts on what's happening, we would love for you to take part by putting up the hashtag AFResearchLab or AFRLInspire so we can not only see your posts, but make sure we can interact with them, keeping it fun. And for those in the audience today, we ask that you silence your cell phones and also refrain from flash photography, just so we don't distract anybody on stage, the lights and all. I could do that to you. And if for any reason you need to stand up and leave, we have two exits in the back, and we ask that you refrain from doing so until the speakers have concluded to respect their time. But in case of an emergency, we have two exits right next to you you can see in the entrance, and the two behind you I pointed out before. So without further ado, none of this would have been made possible without our amazing leadership helping promote and get this event ready. So I ask you all to join me to welcome AFRL's commander, Brigadier General Heather Pringle, to the stage. Good afternoon, AFRL. How are we doing today? Yeah. I'm excited to be here too. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but let me start by saying thank you first of all for the viewers for being here today for your patience in working through our resiliency issues for being our supporters and just being a part of our team. And I know we have a very special guest out there. Someone's mom is here to watch one of their favorite speakers be a participant in today's event. So uh, John Henry's mom out there, I'm glad you're watching too. I want to say thanks to the army of volunteers who made today possible. They were scurrying behind the scenes just to make sure this would go off today and that we could connect and share the story. So I really appreciate all your events or all your efforts and know today wouldn't be possible without everything you've done in the weeks preceding today. For our very special guests, we have two today, Dr. Victoria Coleman, who's coming online from Silicon Valley. She's the chief scientist of the Air Force, and we're really honored to have her participate today. And additionally, we have the chief scientist of the Space Force, Dr. Joel Mo Mosier, who has traveled to Dayton to participate, and thank you for being here. We're really looking forward to those inspiring words because we know at AFRL, we're one lab supporting two services, and we really take that to heart. So we're glad to have the support of both of you today. 
But most importantly, my big shout out goes to the speakers, our stars of the show. I can't tell you how much work that they had done to prepare for last year's event, which wasn't able to occur. But they kept the faith, they kept polishing their stories, and so they are raring to go to provide their unique stories to you today. By the way, they have full-time jobs. They are doing this on the side. They are sons and daughters, husbands and wives, moms and dads. So they're truly remarkable people, and I'm so looking forward to hearing what their stories are. And then we throw challenges at them, like COVID, and doing all those important missions on top of being geographically dispersed, on top of being socially distanced. Truly remarkable what this uh, workforce does. The speakers today represent all of our AFRL workforce. All these scientists, those engineers, those functional professionals that know the ins and outs of contracting and finance and legal and so much more. We know this mission wouldn't be possible without all of you working together. So I'm ready to hear just a snapshot of what this amazing AFRL workforce does. I'm ready to connect I'm ready to learn, and I'm ready to be inspired. Back over to you, Kenneth. Dr. Victoria Coleman, who is now joining us virtually. Hi there. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, John Pringle. Thank you so much for the generous remarks and the introduction. Um, I am thrilled to be here today. Um, this is actually my first month of service as the Chief Scientist of the United States Air Force. Um, and to have the opportunity to hear some, um, some of the terrific work that's been done at the lab with our people is a real treat. The, um, the Air Force and the Space Force in addition to being the coolest of our services, are also the most technology-centric. Our technology advantage is critical for the success of the missions we are responsible for, and that technology advantage rests on our ability to envision, plan, conduct, and deliver world-class science and technology. The AFRL is, of course, the cornerstone of the Air Force and Space Force technology advantage. Through the pursuit of early stage risky research, all the way to supporting and building capabilities, AFRL delivers. Your work in basic science informs the way forward. Your work in transitioning enables our airmen and guardians to fight back. And your work in supporting acquisition makes the Department of the Air Force a truly smart buyer. So it's a real pleasure to see you here today sharing your insights and learnings with a wide open audience. This open exchange of ideas and learnings and the collaboration we build around them is what it takes to succeed in the era of great power competition. We know we advance the technology advantage of the Air Force and the Space Force by working with the private and commercial sectors alongside academia. This dialogue here today supports and advances that open innovation that is so critical for our national security. So thank you for continuing to innovate in not only what you work on, but how, but how you work and with whom you work. I'm excited to be here and I'm looking forward to hearing the talks. Back over to you, Ken. Another round of applause, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman, for those amazing opening words. And now, we're kicking off this year's talks with a very special guest in person. As mentioned before, we are now welcoming the Chief Scientist of the U.S. Space Force, Dr. Joel Mosier. I'd like to give you a new and important way to think about technology in the future. 
In the last century, Western civilization transformed from an industrial-based society to an information-based society. But today we are on the brink of a new age, the age of human augmentation. In our business and national defense, it's imperative that we embrace this new age, lest we fall behind our strategic competitors. Technology can create superhuman capabilities. By that I mean the combination of human ingenuity and machine efficiency and power and speed can combine to create capabilities that are more than human. Over the coming decade, we will achieve new levels of such human machine teaming and we'll see unimaginable new capabilities as a result. In 2001, a new type of cancer drug made the cover of Time magazine. The innovation of these drugs was underpinned by the Human Genome Project, which took 13 years using the world's fastest supercomputers to map out all the base pairs that make up human DNA. Further biotechnology research dived deep into the complex communications mechanisms within the human cell. One of these drugs, called Gleevec, blocks an enzyme that tells a cancer cell to grow, called a tyrosine kinase. Gleevec was first used to treat leukemia patients. Later, it was discovered to be effective against another type of cancer, a rare gastrointestinal cancer called GIST. In 2012, Gleevec was approved to treat just cancer. I know this because in 2013, just one year later, I was diagnosed with just cancer. And if it wasn't for this bit of technology, I would not be here today to give this speech. That is truly superhuman. Technology can create new and powerful ways to, to grow. Um, and there are many examples of this age of human technology, human, human technology. One of the, the things that uh, we see is that uh, humans and computers are finding new ways to team. This, this age of human augmentation is being driven by two forces, the, the exponential increase in the rate of technology and the convergence of multiple technologies to create new capabilities. Let me give you a few examples. This is the stunning Elbe Philharmonic. This, this concert hall was started out as a simple sound map designed by acoustician Yasuhita Toyota. Fortunately, we have new tools in the toolbox to do hu human com computer in uh, interactions, the tools of parametric, algorithmic, and generative design. Although this started out as a simple sound map, it was done with the help of a computer. Every element of the size and shape and structure of this concert hall was, was, is unique. In fact, there are more than 10,000 acoustic tiles in this concert hall. Each one is a snowflake specifically designed to achieve the, the sound map laid out by Mr. Toyota, shown here pointing to one of those acoustic tiles. Superhuman. Another example is this motorcycle swing arm. This was done with the help of a generative algorithm. These type of genetic algorithms take only the most basic inputs from a human. And using trial and error and, and digital testing and elimination, can develop something based on only the broadest of inputs. Perhaps you tell it what the loads you want are, the envelope that it must fit in. And a computer will design this. Coupled with another emerging technology, additive manufacturing, this technology, this swing arm could be produced in a way no human could have done individually. Technology can also create a superhuman workforce. Today, we send individuals to, to schools to learn in groups with set objectives and standardized curriculum. But imagine if we could use technology to identify early on in a student's career their aptitudes and propensities and their, their probability to, to learn. And you could define an individualized curriculum designed specifically for them 
to take advantage of those skills. And using technologies such as augmented reality and virtual reality and nerve stimulation, you could put that individual into a state of flow where learning is optimized and retention is maximized. Now imagine if you had dozens or hundreds or thousands of such individuals. Using algorithms and, and analytics, you could take a subset of those individuals, each with a unique skill print developed through this process, or according to my friend and futurist, Dr. Gabriella Rizzo, a sculpture. This individual could be, be shaped into somebody with very high performing potential. And if you took a subset of these folks and, and put them towards a team to, to solve a particular problem or to perform a new duty, that team would likely achieve superhuman results, at least compared to our traditional way of training and teaming. That is superhuman. IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at the game of chess by looking tens or hundreds of thousands of moves ahead. IBM's Watson beat Ken Jennings at the game of Jeopardy by having petabytes of information at its disposal. Google's AlphaGo beat the world's best players at the incredibly complex game of Go by studying strategy from the world's best players. But I'd like to talk for a second about a subsequent piece of hardware or in software called AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero differed from its predecessors in that it was not, AlphaGo was taught the game of, of strategy by looking at the best human players, but AlphaGo Zero was not told strategy at all. In fact, at the beginning, it only knew the rules of the game. It, it played games against itself using reinforcement learning until it could anticipate its own moves. And eventually, after thousands and thousands of games, could understand how those moves would impact the outcome of the game. After three days and, and millions of plays, AlphaGo Zero was able to beat AlphaGo. After 21 days, AlphaGo Zero was completely unbeatable. It developed new and innovative strategies, some of which we don't even understand. And that is a little bit scary. Sometimes machine learning algorithms reach their objectives in ways that we don't necessarily comprehend. We must be careful of this. But imagine if we use this technology, these capabilities wisely in our military systems in force design, it could be a force multiplier. If we find ways to, to bring um, decisions to humans, Technology can produce superhuman decisions by, by giving us a broader selection and a wider array of decisions than a human could come up with alone. Let the AIs crunch the possibilities and, and let the humans do what humans do best. Resolve ambiguity, apply judgment, morality, and ethics. The results would be superhuman. We should be and we will be uh, applying artificial intelligence agents to our war games, both on the blue side and the red side. We will find ways to bring AI informed data to our commanders and decision makers so that they can crunch the possibilities and develop strategy and tactics that no human could do. And this will extend to the battlefield where Commanders and decision makers will have at their disposal multiple autonomous agents, each able to autonomously control the execution of things like reconnaissance or fire control or attack. And we must think carefully about the ethics of this and how we will trust these autonomous agents, especially in an era of lethal autonomous warfare. But I assure you, our adversaries are developing these technologies, and we simply cannot afford to lag in this area. The possibilities are boundless. AFRL is at the forefront of, of pushing the exponential growth of these technologies and the convergence of these technologies. And you are creating new superhuman capabilities. I'm inspired by your work 
And I commission you all to continue to lead us into the age of human education. But our next speaker is somebody who's truly an overachiever and a true trailblazer. She's somebody who knew exactly what she wanted to do with her life at a very young age. She was only eight years old when she was walking home from school, when she saw F-16s flying overhead. And right then and there, she knew she wanted to be a pilot. And now she's a very experienced one, leading testing at AFRL's Munitions Directorate. So to hear a story about how she bounced back from a pretty difficult situation, let's hear from Lieutenant Colonel Olivia Pai Elliott. So there I was. It's 2 AM. I'm four hours into a ground support mission providing armed overwatch. I'm in my mighty A-10 warthog, circling high above a small village. It's pitch black outside, and I am bored. My five-hour energy is gone. The bridge of my nose aches from the constant pressure of my night vision goggles, and I have to pee. But that's when I see it, right there in my targeting pod display, a bunch of white, hot, infrared signatures appear as if out of nowhere. My wingman confirmed it. 12 to 15 individuals had just emerged from a building and were headed straight towards the team we were there to protect. Together, we warned, warned the ground forces of the emerging threat. And what followed was nearly five minutes of constant communication as we talked to every ground commander, air commander, operations center, even some lawyers, anyone we thought that needed to know about the situation, all the while watching the slow, meandering, stealthy approach of the enemy. And then it happened. They got too close to the friendly position. Hog one, you're cleared in hot. It was go time. Hog one is in hot. I roll in straight down the middle of that village. I put my gun cross smack in the middle of that group. Pulling the trigger, I decimate the entire, and I mean the entire herd of goats. The thrill of victory gave way to a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. You see, as I rolled in, those images on my targeting pod display got clearer. And right before the bullets hit those people, it suddenly had four legs. The ground team confirmed it. There was nothing left of those goats. Now, even if you apply the 10% truth rule of all good fighter pilot stories, this is not looking good. The mission was ruined. The objective was lost. The United States government was obligated to the replacement cost of that sad, sickly herd of goats. But worst of all, I was grounded, pending an investigation. When you manage to fail this spectacularly, how do you recover from it? I was a big, bad A-10 pilot whose cocky attitude would have made Maverick look humble. I was supposed to be the hero, the flying knight in titanium armor, not the annihilator of barnyard creatures. Self-doubt is not a comfortable feeling, and I didn't like it. My actions were laid bare before that investigation board as they dissected my every decision and questioned my every choice. But to truly understand the devastation this had on me, you have to go back to the pre-goat pie. I was a straight-A student in high school, all state, cross country, and track. I graduated number two from the academy as an intercollegiate athlete and a jump master on the wings of blue team. I had won a prestigious scholarship to study abroad after the academy, where I got not one, but two master's degrees in two years. I was dedicated to my flight training. I worked my tail off. But I did not fail. And yet, here I was, twiddling my thumbs, wondering 
if everything I'd worked for since I was 12 years old was lost in an event that happened in less than five minutes. As I sat chained to that ops desk, staring bleakly out the window, watching my squadron mates take off on mission after mission after mission, I felt desolated. I had given it my best, and I had fallen short. After what seemed like an eternity, the investigation board concluded. No statements, no recommendations. I was returned to flying status. Not the same egomaniacal attack pilot as before. A bit more cautious, a lot less self-assured. But the mission of protecting ground forces was still mine, and I had to move forward. A lot of you may be sitting out there saying, that's a pretty funny story, Pi, but it doesn't apply to me. I'm an AFRL. I'm an engineer. I'm a program manager. I'm a contractor. I'm not a warfighter. I don't pull the trigger. But I would suggest that you're wrong. You see, you're not just working in some academic lab somewhere on an esoteric technology. At AFRL, we have a really tough mission. We are supposed to look into the future and develop those capabilities and technologies to enable the next generation of warfighter to win in a battle space that has not yet been defined against an enemy that has not yet been determined with weapons that don't yet exist. Weapons that you're supposed to create. How many of you have ever pitched a great idea that was never even considered for development? How many of you have worked on a program that got canceled because the results weren't as good as or as quick as leadership wanted? How many of you developed an enabling technology that worked great only to watch it be put on a shelf when it didn't transition? How many of you have given it your all and felt like you came up empty? Third application to the NASA astronaut program, but I'm still not an astronaut. Mission failed, right? The answer to these questions are your own personal herd of goats. But you can't let that failure be the final chapter. The mission is still yours. The warfighter is counting on us to keep going, to keep trying, to keep putting those ideas out there. At AFRL, we're not the ones that pull the trigger. We're the ones that make that trigger better, more accurate, more lethal. We have to design, develop, and build those innovative technologies to support the next generation of warfighter so that they can decimate herds of goats. Thank you for sharing that story with us, Pi. I think we can all relate. I mean, bouncing back from something difficult, picking ourselves back up and making sure we continue the mission. I mean, it's like she mentioned. While the mission can be tough, the warfighters are counting on us. So inspiring words to remember. Now our next speaker is no stranger to overcoming obstacles. He is a product line lead in our 7-Eleven Human Performance Wing and works on a lot of very cool systems that answer a lot of uh, Air Force needs. Those systems, you ask? Well, they're physiological monitoring systems. And these are meant to check out our pilots, operators, and more. And he is dedicated to his craft. So much so, he actually goes out in the field sometimes or with a lot of these trainers to make sure these systems are working. There's a story I heard that he actually went out to a remote campsite in Texas to work alongside SEER operators just to make sure everything was working properly. That's awesome. So now, join me and welcome to the stage to talk more about his story in this amazing journey, AFRL's top pick for the next season of Survivor, Dr. James Christensen.
picture yourself crawling into an aircraft's fuel tank. You have to carefully squeeze through this hatch that's smaller than your shoulders. Inside, the only light comes from your headlamp as you're surrounded by the smell of jet fuel. You wriggle deeper in as the ribs of the tank cut and scrape at your skin, and the cool air pumped in from the hatch dries your sweat. The heat from the warm skin of the aircraft is just inches from your face as you contort yourself until your hands are free to start working, hoping that you remembered everything you need to bring in and do, because otherwise you'll be making that painful crawl back all, out all over again. You take some comfort from knowing that just outside the hatch, you've got a wingman there to talk to you and make sure that you're okay. But you have to push aside the knowledge that should you become trapped or suffer a medical emergency, they cannot come in after you. Instead, you'll have to wait for an incident response team, which could take 30 minutes or more. This uncomfortable scenario is a daily reality for hundreds of airmen in our maintenance community, the largest career field in the Air Force. Okay, let's talk regulations. We're the Air Force, we love regulations. According to OSHA and Air Force regulations, a confined space is an enclosed area not designed for habitation with hazards present, such as getting stuck or toxic fumes. Regulations require that people working in these areas be continuously monitored by someone sitting outside doing nothing else except verbally verifying the safety of the person working inside. At Warner Robins Air Logistics Complex alone, airmen spend more than 40,000 hours a year doing confined space work that's critically necessary to get aircraft back in the air and keep them flying. For every space that's entered, there's another airman sitting outside doing nothing else except monitoring the work going on inside. That adds up to nearly another 40,000 hours a year of labor. The Air Force does this type of work very safely, but it is costly and time consuming. You might be thinking, we must have robots or maybe some remote controlled means of doing this work, but we don't. The fact is, robots can't handle it. It takes the strength, flexibility, endurance, perceptive skills, and intelligence that only a human can provide in a compact enough package. The need for airmen to do this type of work isn't going away, but we can make it better. And it won't require inventing a lot of new technology. We just have to reinvent how we use a few ordinary pieces of technology that we usually take for granted. A few years ago, an engineer was working on a major upgrade to the C-5 cargo and transport plane that required long hours of confined space work inside the aircraft structure. This engineer happened to visit a family member in the hospital and saw that the nurse's station had a screen which displayed all the vital signs for the patients in the ward in one place with a few flashing that action was required. Now there are big differences between a hospital ward and an aircraft maintenance facility, but this engineer had a spark of innovation. What if instead of sitting outside a hatch monitoring, we could monitor all of the work remotely? Instead of yelling back and forth, we could use radios. Instead of just saying, I'm okay, we could monitor vital signs. Instead of checking that the air is safe to breathe once before we go in, we could monitor it continuously right around the worker. Turning that spark of inspiration into a reality is where my team came in. In translating hospital technology to confined space maintenance, our team of scientists and engineers saw some obvious problems. Big monitoring boxes, lots of wires running everywhere, nurses and techs to put electrodes on and replace them, not compatible with unheated aircraft hangars and getting into and out of very tight spaces. But what could work? You might not think of a smartphone as a maintenance tool or an athletic heart rate monitor as a safety device, but after a lot of trial and error, our team put these together with software and the right procedures to develop an inexpensive means for freeing up labor to get aircraft back to flying faster. Our first idea for vital signs monitoring 
was to use chest band heart rate monitors, the kind of thing many people use to do zone exercise. They're cheap, easy to use, and durable. That idea lasted about five minutes after we had someone wear one while crawling into a fuel tank. As soon as they were inside the hatch, it was down around their waist and no longer functional. Next, we tried a shirt that had the electronics in the middle of the chest. Very Iron Man, Kenneth. Very cool. Except when you lie down to crawl into the space, that pushes the button on the front and turns it off. We tried a device that was attached with an adhesive patch, which worked really well, right up until you start sweating, and it falls off. Remember what I said about the difficulty of getting into these spaces? Finally, we found a shirt that was originally designed for professional athletes. It's a compression shirt that holds heart rate, motion, and respiration sensors tightly against your skin with a smooth exterior that doesn't get snagged and lightweight, breathable fabric that's comfortable even in Georgia in the summer. Smartphones work well as a data and communications hub. With Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and processing power, they're great at pulling together data from multiple devices. But carrying a smartphone into a confined space means just another piece of equipment that could get dropped or wedged somewhere. So we left the smartphones right outside the confined space and instead used smart watches for communications and user interface, something that was attached, accessible, and available that enables you to call for help or simply ask for a tool. We bought a number of examples of current smartwatches and had someone wear one while going into a confined space. The band broke in about 10 minutes. So we designed an armband holder that was much more rugged. That broke after about 10 minutes. We redesigned the armband holder and came up with a 3D printed holder that's smooth on the outside. It lets you press all the buttons and it holds up to extended heavy use. With all of our creative use of existing technology, you also have to recognize when you've got a problem that really does require you to come up with something new. To ensure that the air is safe to breathe, maintainers currently take a sample just inside the hatch once prior to entry. To make that easier and safer, our team developed miniaturized wearable sensors like this one that can continuously monitor for oxygen and explosive gases right where the worker is and then send that data wirelessly back outside the space. All of this iteration and learning takes time, so much time, and the right environment to test it in. So how do you conduct realistic testing of a maintenance monitoring system? The reserve squadron at Wright Pad quit taking my calls after I kept asking to go diving into their fuel tanks, and the museum didn't trust me to go crawling around inside their historic artifacts. After a whole lot of calls and emails, we found a set of C-130 wings at Warner Robins that had been removed at the end of their service life and were destined for the scrapyard. After some more calls and emails, I filled out a shipping requisition form, sent it in, and was told I'd get a call when the wings left Warner Robins on their way to Dayton. That call didn't come, and I went on leave with my family in a remote area with minimal cell phone service. I got back into service, and hey, what do you know? A driver who'd never been to Wright Pat before showed up at the main gate with no base access and a flatbed load of C-130 wings wanting to know where he could drop them off. <laughs> a couple of my colleagues really stepped up for me and got it sorted, including jumping up in the cab with the driver to get him through the gate. And by the time I got home a couple of days later, I was the proud owner of a set of C-130 wings sitting in the parking lot outside of our building. A couple of months later, we had one of them installed indoors as a dedicated test stand that enabled us to break many more watch bands without interfering with actual maintenance. The system has matured to the point that we've tested it at squadron scale in actual maintenance. That validated that we can reduce the labor required for safety monitoring by 80% or 32,000 hours a year at Warner Robins alone. Those safety monitors are all maintainers themselves who would almost always rather be working 
than watching someone else. So that labor goes right back into getting aircraft back in the air faster without compromising worker safety. Since our last test, the team has supported the launch of a new company created just to market and sustain this system. We closed out the AFRL project earlier this year with a COVID-compliant remote demonstration of our remote monitoring system. I was hoping for a large-scale in-person demonstration, but by going virtual, we enabled well over 100 people to attend and see live real-time monitoring of maintainers and team members spread across five states, from California to Georgia. Though we've closed out the AFRL work, the project and the team continues, establishing the relationships with other industries to enable them to use the system and achieve Air Force levels of safety at a very affordable cost. I look forward to seeing the system in use with municipal sewer workers, construction, and agricultural workers. The U.S. alone suffers more than 100 deaths per year in confined space work in these industries. In the course of, if we could save even a fraction of those lives, that would justify everything that our team has done. In the course of doing this work, I've watched airmen come out of aircraft, bloody and bruised, drenched in fuel and sweat. They are nevertheless deeply proud of the work that they do and grateful for our efforts to make it just a bit better. And all with a smartphone, some athletic gear, an idea we borrowed from the hospital, but most importantly, a team of very dedicated people who saw things not as they are, but as they could be. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. That was a very amazing story that shows how a lot of our work can affect both airmen and guardians alike. And if you're interested in learning more about what he talked about above, I was one of the co-hosts on our Lab Life podcast. We actually got a chance to speak with him. So make sure to check it out on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, really wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more. So it's great to know that you're on our team. Now, our next speaker actually has a lot in common with Dr. Christensen, though they come from different fields. Their work is very complementary. One works a lot of these cool tests that you saw and making sure these products work. The other one is a researcher of combustion. So let me put it into context. Let's use a GPS. That's a good example. Let's say Dr. Christensen's team is the one that does a lot of the work to make sure these systems work and the satellite operates as intended. Our next speaker is one who helps develop the propellant and the engines to get it up there. He is a self-proclaimed propellant enthusiast or propulsion enthusiast who works on awesome propellants that create giant balls of flame. So join me in welcoming AFRL's very own rocket engine man to Captain Tyler Ratsack. How many of you had a package delivered to your house today? In the last week, how many of you have had groceries or takeout delivered or checked the weather forecast? These everyday activities have one thing in common. They're made possible by satellite technology. Right now, 2,700 man-made objects are orbiting the Earth, beaming down GPS, banking, weather, and military data. Getting these satellites from the launch pad up into a precise orbit in outer space requires rocket engines. Just like gas-powered cars, rockets have engines that convert the chemical energy stored in fuel into motion. In a car, the hot expanding gases are captured by the engine's pistons and transformed directly into mechanical motion. In a rocket engine, the hot expanding gases shoot directly out of the bottom of the combustion chamber, producing thrust. I'm part of a research team that's developing a new rocket engine called the Rotating Detonation Rocket Engine, or RDRE for short. The RDRE breaks the mold of conventional rocket engine design by using a fundamentally different way to harness the energy that's stored in fuel. In order to understand this difference, we're gonna have to begin with an equation any high school chemistry student can recite from memory. A hydrocarbon-like methane plus oxygen reacts to form carbon dioxide and water. The reactants on the left are rearranged through combustion to form the products on the right, unleashing the energy that's used to create thrust. In the world of combustion, the star of the show is the arrow at the center of the equation. It represents the chemical reactions that drive molecular change forward. Normal 
everyday combustion occurs via a process called deflagration, which you can think of as simple burning. But under the right conditions, an alternate path called detonation, think explosions, can be taken. While both modes end up with the same final arrangement of molecules, the two paths behave entirely different. We encounter deflagration every day through running car engines and backyard barbecues, and it's what's used to power all modern rocket engines. Let's see deflagration in action. This bowl has been filled with a mixture of soap and water. I'm using this balloon that has been filled with propane to create fuel bubbles. When I introduce an initial energy source, the reaction will begin. Heat transfer, which is the exchange of energy between molecules, is what causes the flame to spread from that initial spark and then travel through the rest of the bowl. We see this process occur in slow motion during a wildfire. At the edge of the flame, the untouched grass is slowly being heated, raising its temperature until it begins to burn and the, fryer is able to, and the fire is able to creep forward. This is exactly what just happened in the bowl, but at a faster speed. The other mode of combustion is detonation. Instead of using heat transfer to move the flame, detonation spread with a pressure wave. Sound is a pressure wave. And if I talk louder, I can put more energy into it. If you create a strong enough pressure wave that compresses the right mixture of fuel and oxygen, that mixture will combust, adding even more energy back into the passing pressure wave. And it's the coupling of these two processes that creates a detonation. With a high-speed camera, that pressure wave can be seen after a detonation. Just like sound, it moves away from its source, creating an expanding bubble of compression around the source of the detonation. Let's see this in action. Now, before I begin the second demonstration, I must say that hearing protection is absolutely required for this one. I'm going to use the same soap and water mixture. However, this time I've also added oxygen, which will increase the initial reaction speed and enable a weak detonation to form. Again, with the introduction of initial energy source, the reaction begins. <laughs> Detonations move way faster than deflagration, up to 4,000 miles per hour, which is twice the speed of a bullet. More importantly, they're, better, they're more efficient at converting the chemical energy that's stored in fuel into thrust. Harnessing such a rapid release of energy without destroying your combustion chamber is no easy task. It's the reason why rocket designers from the 1950s all the way up to present day have opted to rely on deflagration to power rockets. The RDRE is the first rocket engine to overcome this limitation, and it's able to do so by using a specially designed cylindrical combustor. One end of the combustor is open, that's where the hot exhaust shoots out, and the other end is closed, which is where a mixture of fuel and oxygen are injected. Instead of producing a single loud bang, like we just saw in the second demo, the shape of the combustor allows the pressure wave from the detonation to revolve around the engine's perimeter, constantly moving into freshly injected reactants and leaving hot, high-pressure products behind. This results in a perpetual detonation, one that endlessly chases itself around the combustion chamber, completing about 30,000 laps every second. To the naked eye, RDRV exhaust looks pretty similar to a conventional rocket engine. But when viewed with a high-speed camera, the individual revolving detonation can be seen. Now, depending on the particular design of the RDRE, as well as the mixture of fuel and oxygen that's used, different numbers of detonations will be present. In this test case, you can see three of them. RDRE development is moving fast. My team has already conducted 1,500 prototype engine firings on several different RDRE concept designs in the last three years. Our calculations already show a theoretical 10% improvement in thermal efficiency, and we're beginning to solve the more practical problems of rocket engine design, like vacuum performance and propellant delivery. Now I know 10% more efficient might sound a little underwhelming, but in the world of rocket propulsion, that's a huge deal. Between the government and private companies, the US has an $86 billion per year space economy, which you and I, as taxpayers, have to foot the bill for. 
The RDRE can help cut these costs, not just through improved fuel economy, but by offering an entirely new, more robust engine architecture. Let's look at three examples that highlight some of these benefits. First, maintaining stable combustion in a conventional rocket engine is a challenge. The Mammoth F1 engine that was used to get man to the moon is a classic example of this problem. During the engine's development, researchers discovered that deflagration engines could burn unpredictably, like a candle fluttering in the wind. The resulting vibrations from this fluctuation would literally shake the engine to pieces as it was running, ultimately resulting in catastrophic failure. Even with NASA and the F1 engine designers racing as fast as they could, to get a man on the moon by the end of the decade, it still took four years and 2,000 full-scale engine tests in order for them to fully resolve this issue with their engine. RDREs are designed to harness combustion instabilities. It's actually what creates that revolving detonation inside the combustion chamber. This attribute eliminates a huge design challenge, saving a significant amount of time and money that would have otherwise been spent on development. Example two. Conventional rocket engines have extremely complex mechanical systems. In order to achieve efficient burn, deflagration-based rocket engines use pumps to pressurize the liquid fuel and oxygen all the way up to 4,000 PSI. The pumps are the size of a mini-fridge, have the same horsepower as 25 Ferraris, and have to move liquid oxygen that's been chilled all the way down to negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Their design is one of the most challenging parts of building a modern rocket engine. The RDRE also requires high pressure in order to achieve efficient combustion, but instead of relying on a complex mechanical pump, the RDRE is able to leverage that revolving pressure wave inside of its combustion chamber to generate the necessary compression. RDREs do still need a pump to physically move the propellant from the tank into the engine, but with an order of magnitude lower pressure and horsepower requirements, its design becomes relatively simple. Example three, satellites in orbit have only a finite amount of fuel in their tank, and once they've consumed that, they lose a lot of their value. US geostationary weather satellites are equipped with an onboard engine that they use to maintain the correct orbit for the duration of their 15-year life. Replacing the current satellite engine with an RDRE would boost fuel efficiency, gaining two more years or 13% life out of the onboard fuel. There are currently four of these satellites in orbit, and there are two more scheduled to launch this year. At $700 million per copy, life extension for this satellite series alone represents a huge ability to save costs. RDREs still need more development to prove that they're ready to power a billion dollar system. But with a solid scientific advantage and a well-engineered design, I know they're up to the challenge. Right now, there are 2,700 man-made objects put into orbit around the Earth using deflagration engines. I can't wait to see how our everyday lives are going to improve once our DREs get to start helping with the heavy lifting. Thank you. Honestly, I wish Captain Ratsack could have been my neighbor growing up. I had a lot of science experiments that needed more, uh, oomph. <laughs> but our next speaker is kind of following along that same line, talking about taking passions that you've loved and turning it into a career. And she based her career on something that was influenced by her childhood. While not in the military, every two years her family would move to seek new opportunities, resulting in her living in eight different states, three different countries, and she now knows four languages. So here to talk about how her love of linguistics has re influenced her research, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Mia Peters. Two things to know about me. I love languages and I love technology. When I was in high school, I learned Portuguese after spending a year in Brazil. Unfortunately, when I returned to the US, I lost my ability to speak, mainly because of limited opportunities to converse in the language. At that time, I remember thinking, 
hmm, I should create a system that will speak with me in Portuguese so I don't lose it. You see, Who are you? I am a manifestation of what you wanted to build in high school. So again, why did you want something like me to exist? Well, it was to maintain a language that's rarely spoken in my country of origin. Country of origin? Where are you from? Oh, so I'm originally from the US, but I speak three foreign languages through Youth Exchange and Peace Corps. Now, as What I languages do you speak? Je parle français. You speak French. Et eu falo português. You speak Portuguese. You mentioned that. Nihongo hanashimas. You speak Japanese. Cool. How are you going to make a conversational AI like me a reality? Hmm. Cool. In my field, we call that a conversational marker. We use it all the time to make dialogues flow. But there's actually still a lot of debate on whether it should be used in systems like you. I digress. I've always wanted to combine my love of languages and technology to create conversational agents, especially for the Air Force. Similar to how Data from Star Trek, C-3PO from Star Wars, and um, Jarvis from Iron Man teamed with a group of humans and supported them on their missions, I think it would be amazing if similar technologies could support our military. Imagine the near-term possibilities. These systems could teach our war fighters new languages. They could transcribe planning and debrief data in real time. They could even execute voice commands in harsh environments. In the long term, I believe these systems will have capabilities that resemble the characters portrayed in Hollywood, especially in terms of how they speak. Natural communication between humans and machines will completely transform how our military engage with AI. Now, it sounds like conversational AI can really benefit the Air Force. What does your research focus on? So we want to create speech interfaces that allow people and machines to speak with one another seamlessly. In order to accomplish this, systems must have the ability to respond naturally and appropriately. This is called natural language generation, and there are three key tenets. What a system should say, how it should say it, and when it should say it. Now in terms That's a of helpful overview. Let's start with what to say. What should conversational AI say to warfighters? Thank you. I was just getting to that. Simply put, conversational AI should communicate like their human teammates. For example, battlefield warfighters communicate in fast pace, time critical, complex, noisy environments. They use a speech protocol to help minimize communication errors while maintaining fast and effective performance. Now in this example, a conversational AI should not, should not only know this very specific protocol, but also have the language to repair errors when they occur. One of the goals of our research is to integrate repair strategies into conversational agents. The goal is to create system responses that help humans know what part of their message was misunderstood or misinterpreted. What part of the message was Miss Underwood or Mr. Bread? <laughs> no, misunderstood or misinterpreted. But that is a great example of the problem. You see, what she just did is very difficult for conversational AI. When these systems don't, don't understand us, they ask us to repeat. They say they don't know. Or worse, they don't respond at all. And this doesn't help us know how to fix the problem. If these systems could identify and repair communication errors, something humans do with minimal effort, it would bring them that much closer to natural communication with us. Is that right? Are you asking me if what I said is correct or 
Are you using an idiom to acknowledge that you understood? The latter. I see. I assume the former. But that's actually a good example of the second tenet of natural, natural language generation, how a system should say something. You see, even if a system uses the exact same words, where they place the emphasis can completely change the meaning of a statement. Current conversational AI are not very good at varying their intonation to show intent and meaning. In order to overcome this challenge, our group is inter interested in exploring how to manipulate the acoustic signatures of these systems to make them sound a lot more natural. I am learning a lot about the future of natural language generation in conversational AI systems like myself. I remember you mentioned when to say it. Tell me more about that. Wow, I can't believe you remembered something I mentioned earlier. You know, that's still a huge challenge for conversational AI. Listen, it's not enough that these systems know what to say and how to say it. Timing and conversation is very important. In a recent study, our team found that conversational AI that interrupt people while they're performing a task frustrates them and causes them to make more mistakes. You know, come to think about it, you actually interrupted me a lot during this presentation and that wasn't a very pleasant experience. I'm sorry. No need to apologize. I just want to emphasize to you and to the audience that getting the timing right in these systems will make them much easier to talk to. Wow, so let me see if I can summarize. You and your team of researchers at the Air Force Research Laboratory aim to invent the future of conversational AI that will allow humans and AI to communicate naturally. That's exactly it. We want to make advances like Data, C-3PO, Jarvis, and so many others a reality for the Air Force and DOD at large, especially in terms of getting these systems to speak more naturally. Am I the droid you're looking for? Uh, no. <laughs> you are a manifestation of a high school dream. But that dream inspired the heart of a young researcher to embark on a journey and create a new wave of communication technologies. Technologies that will completely transform how we engage with AI using our most natural way of communicating, speech. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Your technology has that certain je ne sais quoi. Well, really ought to teach people like me how to speak French again. But I see you all may notice my costume change, which may be popping up a tag. This guy. <laughs> see, after hearing a lot of people talk about childhood dreams, aspirations, and really following those goals, why can't I follow my childhood dream of being an F1 driver? See? A for L, got everything up here. It's pretty cool, right, guys? <laughs> so if you do laugh or before you laugh, hear me out. I have a plan for this, so I was thinking, with all of our like, talks today, a lot of people could be part of my F1 dream team. Dr. Peters, for instance, could help prepare me for my next Grand Prix with her linguistic software. Uh, Captain Rathsack can make sure my engine is super boosted, ready to go. And my good friend Dr. Christensen can make sure I'm monitored during the race so I'm safe. And I'm thinking, another person from my F1 dream team is our next speaker. He's a digital engineer who works on things like this to make sure that certain technologies are well set and well tested before they hit the track. So here to talk about digital twins is Dr. James Sumter. Imagine Lewis Hamilton, seven-time Formula One world champion at Silverstone Raceway, hurtling down the hangar straight toward turn 15 at 200 miles per hour. The engineer radios in. You gotta take it easy in this turn, your brakes are going to overheat. The engineer can't physically see Lewis or his car, and Lewis hasn't said anything to indicate that there is an issue. 
How can an engineer sitting a mile away in the paddock predict and provide information in real time? It's possible because the engineers have a high fidelity connected real time digital twin of Lewis's car that enables them to make these kinds of early assessments. The Digital Twin Consortium defines a digital twin as a virtual representation of real world entities and processes synchronized at a specified frequency and fidelity. Put another way, a digital twin is a model of your system in a computer that you connect in real time with data fed from sensors in and around your physical system, which we'll call the physical twin. Formula One teams have been developing and applying the principles of twinning for more than 30 years. Digital twins enable engineers to digitally assess what's happened to their cars in the past, what's happening to their cars at this current moment, and use that information to predict and adapt to what will happen in the future, often without bringing cars back into the paddock. Armed with this information, Formula One teams make hundreds of changes to a car in a single race and thousands of changes to a car over the course of a season. Accelerating innovation, digital twins enable racing teams to remain competitive in one of the fastest sports on the planet. Digital twins aren't just used in Formula One. They're employed across a variety of industries. NASA pioneered the use of the twin in the 1960s during the Apollo moon missions, building a full-size replica of the Apollo capsule. NASA's pioneering work in twins continues today and is exemplified in the twins of the Perseverance rover on Mars and its earthbound sibling, Optimism. Here at Eglin Air Force Base, we're building a modern type of twin for the Air Force a digital twin of Air Force weapons and assets. Today's digital twins talk to their physical counterparts. A bi-directional conversation exchanging sensor data, predictions, and updates. We leverage this dialogue to continuously and iteratively update our weapon systems. It's a constantly improving feedback loop that we can apply throughout the life of a weapon. What does the life cycle of a new weapon system look like from the perspective of the digital twin? Which comes first, the digital or the physical twin? With modern design and engineering workflows and tools, a new weapon system begins life in the digital realm. Starting from requirements and concepts, a weapon's shape and structure all its internal components, their interfaces and functions, are each modeled, simulated, and analyzed in engineering discipline-specific tools. Aerodynamics, mechanical, electrical, and software characteristics are all built first in the virtual digital world. This collection of models and simulations represent a virtual prototype of our system and it can describe the system with enough detail to continue through the next phases of the life cycle, development, and test. Adding hardware in the loop, we build physical prototypes of our system to further prove out and mature the concept until it's ready for production. Finally, when the physical weapon system is manufactured, connected, and operational, the digital twin really comes alive. Twin means two, and we don't have a twin of anything until we have both the digital and the physical coexisting. Digital twins connect the real world and the virtual world across time, space, and domains. Twins have been around and used for decades. Why is now the time for the Air Force to invest and develop digital twin technologies applied to weapon systems? There are three driving factors. First, technology convergence. Second, data as an asset. And third, the need to adapt in the face of pure threat evolution. Let's consider each of these three factors in the context of the twin. 
First, technology is an enabling factor. Technologies from the digital and the physical realm have been advancing dramatically in recent years. And the convergence of these areas has really opened up where digital twins can be useful. Three key areas of technology advancement needed to happen to make twins truly useful to the Air Force. First, the advent of small, powerful sensors. Second, a secure means to transmit that sensor data. And third, the ability to rapidly analyze that data to inform quick decisions. Thanks to a panoply of developments across a variety of fields, including autonomous cars, cell phones, mobile electronics, the maker movement, an explosion of software development, and incredibly talented scientists and engineers, we have all the ingredients to build our digital twins. Data is the second driving factor. The power of the twin comes from turning data into information. A tremendous amount of data is generated for our weapon systems throughout their life cycle. This data is stored on servers and workstations housed in the secure areas of buildings, largely inaccessible and often effectively lost. Accessing and analyzing this data across a patchwork of formats and proprietary models can be time consuming. Looking for this data is tricky. Finding this data is hard. And truly understanding the complex interactions and the cause and effect between systems is nigh impossible. Digital twins change the paradigm. Digital twins empower us to make intelligent sense of complex physical systems by making data available, connected, and organized, accessible through secure cloud-enabled environments and underpinned by standards and authoritative sources of truth. Peer adversary systems are sophisticated and evolving. The third forcing function is peer threat evolution. As Air Force Chief of Staff General Brown highlighted in his strategic approach titled Accelerate, Change, or Lose, the fight is changing and we need to position ourselves to adapt. Logistics and supply chains will be challenged. Every gallon of gas will matter. Every bullet, every bomb, every missile will matter. Every tactical strike that we cannot plan and assess with the utmost accuracy and optimization will by its very nature threaten the entire mission chain, prolonging the conflict, requiring more supplies, and put more people at risk more often. To adapt and pivot for the future fight, we need to shift from telling our warfighter, you got what you got, and design and develop the capability to rapidly evolve what you got into what you need. Digital twins enable us to do just this, leveraging technology as the whetstone to sharpen the tip of the spear. In Formula One, no two races are the same. In combat, no two missions are the same. What does the future hold for digital twins and our mission to provide our airmen with a competitive edge against a peer adversary? Operationally, we can continuously improve and update our weapon systems through software updates, just like you get on your phone, or rapidly adapt and update hardware for a specific mission. Digital twins enable us to track how an asset has been stored and used what temperature, extremes, shocks, vibrations, and g-forces has it experienced. Condition-based monitoring, coupled with predictive maintenance algorithms, allow Air Force maintenance crews to fix things before they break. The next-gen twins that we're building in the lab will be architected to speed decision support for mission planning, execution, and tactics optimization. We are exploiting the fusion of emerging technologies like Internet of Things, 5G, extended reality, and artificial intelligence. To gain deeper insights into how our weapon systems work together and to rapidly evaluate the effectiveness of new configurations and design variations. 
We are exploring advanced communications and collaborative behaviors to maximize the convergence of effects from a mix of weapons. Weapons and their digital twins will be integrated into the sensor web to provide valuable information about the theater of operations. Formula One teams leverage the value of large amounts of well-organized, connected, accessible data available for use by anyone on the team. Data from digital twins gives engineers the power to virtually iterate and prototype through design concepts in a time and cost efficient manner to yield optimal solutions in a quick decision, high intensity environment. The Air Force is just scratching the surface of what twins will allow us to achieve. Digital twins are the future for getting the most out of emerging technologies. They are a linchpin in the transformation to a digital, agile, open Air Force. They enable the adaptability we need to respond to unimagined threats. Digital twins are an exponential force multiplier that put our warfighter in pole position and give them the winning edge. Don't worry, jacket's still on. Thank you, Dr. Sumter. I know your expertise in the field will make sure I have a competitive advantage that'll be unrivaled. And I know you'll do the same for both our airmen and guardians alike. Now our next speaker, also part of the F1 Dream Team, is gonna make sure that our vehicle is not only able to win, but is able to be environmentally conscious and more sustainable. And this conversation is especially important due to Earth Day having just happened last week. So here to talk about just that, sustainability, please welcome to the stage, Ms. Sarah Talana. We have the power, we have the power to shape our future, a collective future, but a collective future that requires us to rethink sustainability. One of the greatest challenges we face today is finding the balance between our needs, our planet, and our bottom line. This requires us to think sustainability because sustainability is not just about the tree huggers or the peace lovers. Sustainability requires us to make decisions and choices about our present needs without diminishing the need of future generations to meet their needs. In order for us to operate into the future, we have to think not just about what we need, but what is also needed in the future. Sustainability provides us the power to look into our people their stories, our natural resources, the raw materials that are necessary for productions of goods and services, the very essential elements that are needed for the mission, and our economy. As a small child, my parents taught me my first lessons of sustainability. Of course, we did not call it sustainability. It was simply preservation. I was born in El Salvador with very little, and at a time during a civil war, a civil war that pulled the country apart, separated families, set back the country's economy, and claimed the lives of thousands of people. Lucky for me, I won the parents' lottery. I won the parents' lottery because no matter what, my parents always made me feel we had enough. First, we had to nurture the family, take care of the family. Every decision and choice we made was centered around the family well-being. My parents prioritized learning and education. Even in the midst of a civil war, we were made to polish our shoes and walk to school. We lived in a small village. We depended on each other. Our neighbors were a social and support system and a network system. We lived in a farm. We depended on the farm. Those were our natural resources. First, it was our basic needs. Anything else extra we had, we traded with our neighbors. It was a small, simple economic system, but it worked. Because of the violence of the Civil War, my father migrated to the United States. Even though our family was separated for more than 10 years, we were always nurtured and connected. At the time, there was no Facebook, there's no text messages, there's none of the social media things that keep us connected today. We didn't even have a phone in our home. 
However, I recall the excitement of walking and making that phone call and opening and reading letters, the things that keep us connected. I share this with you today because these are the many preservation lessons that are still with us. However, there are times that we lose sight of those things. As leaders, we often find ourselves strategizing on how do we connect our people to the mission, or how do we get more innovative resources to our war fighters, or how do we deal with our programs and projects with the limited financial resources we have. These are some of the things that still affect us and will affect us going forward, but we can find solutions for them. As an adult, I've worked in different sectors that have made me see the interconnection of what sustainability truly is. It's simply about people, planet, and profit. It starts with our people. How do we connect our people to the mission? How do we preserve our AFRL family, our customers, our communities, our business partners? It's understanding our human capital. This is simply what Brenda, borrowing from Brenda Brown, this is simply what she refers to as stepping into the arena and having those brave and tough conversations. Conversations that shape our workforce, conversations about diversity, conversations about inclusion, and definitely conversations about leadership. One of the second elements when we think of sustainability is looking at our planet, our natural resources, the things that actually move us forward. I have to admit, I actually just skipped a few slides to show you guys. That is my home, that is my family, that is where I grew up, this is where my story began. Lucky for me, I had the opportunity to study in Cambridge, and I also had the opportunity to work at Air Fire, uh, Royal Air Force Base Lake and Heath. It was here, actually, in Lake and Heath, where I started to really look at the impact of our community and how much we impact not the, only the inside, but the outside of our installations and everything else we do. While in Cambridge, I actually had the opportunity to study, not just study sustainability, but really understand the impact of what it really means and how our government purchasing power can create sustainable impact. I mentioned that it's about people. I mentioned that it's about the connection that we have when we build to the mission. But I also have to mention our planet, the natural resources that actually connect, the actual resources that actually drive us going forward. While we may not think of these things as vital, we really have to think about the fact that everything we do depends on productions of goods and services. We need air, water to train our airmen. We need materials to develop our research and development, those ideas. We also need profit. We also need profits because these are the things that actually help us support our workforce, support our small business development, support our innovation and our research. The US federal government is said to be the largest consumer in the world, spending over $450 billion in goods and services every year. But what if we use this government purchasing power to not only create services and programs that benefit our end users, but also our society and our economy? Sustainability is evolving and will continue to evolve. Why does it matter? It matters because businesses and organizations are changing, and so is their workforce. Business as usual is no longer acceptable. Employees need to be treated well, and employees are looking for driven, purpose-sense organizations. It also helps us look into what is desire for our, for our future. Now, I know that sustainability sometimes within what we do is not something that we think about, but you really have to think about the fact that we need our people, and our people need to have purpose. We need materials and supplies to do what we do. And we need an economy that supports us going forward. 
We also need to not forget our childhood lessons. We also not need to forget the things that connect us. We also not need to forget the things that we must do to push us forward into the future where a collective future is based not on just our present needs, but also in the ability of future generations to accomplish and have their needs. So first, I'm surprised no one told me the L fell off, but my F1 career is not falling apart yet. <laughs> but thank you, Ms. Talano, for that wonderful speech. It's important to know that we're both environmental and well, stewards of this world, and those connections we make impact a lot. So make sure to keep in mind what she said as we go into our final speaker. Which, I talked about my F1 dream team, and it seems like there's one position missing, and that's position of team captain. And this next speaker fits that perfectly. He is constructive and innovative approach to what he calls constructive free time and how it's going to change your workday is something incredible. So let's go ahead and hear what that all means from John Henry Williams. We live in an innovative world, full of innovative people. And the only way to unlock innovation is to allow those innovative people in that innovative world to come together in an innovative way that allows them to innovate and create new and innovative solutions through innovation. <laughs> Have you ever said a word so many times it loses its meaning? Innovation can be like that. It can sound like a buzzword or an initiative of the week, something that we all agree is necessary to move forward, but so nebulous that you can't get your hands around it. You may have wondered, what does innovation feel like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Well, I can help you with those last two because I've seen it and I've heard it. And admittedly, it looks a little different in 2021 than it did in 2019. But back then, it looked like people getting out of their offices on a Monday morning. It looked like laboratories that are normally occupied by a lone scientist thriving with life. It looked like refreshed relationships and new relationships from people who hadn't had the opportunity to work together before. And it looked like passion and laughter and the genuine curiosity that can only come from thinking about a problem in a new way. And what did it sound like? It sounded like people saying, I am definitely doing things I would have never done before. Or, I ran into an approach that I wouldn't have considered before. Or, well, that was a first. Or my personal favorite, huh, that's weird. And none of these sights and sounds came out of the big book of innovation. They were all actual observations and candid quotes that I collected during a dedicated event that changed the way we do research in my branch and the results are even more applicable today. Now, I'm gonna have to warn you, you're gonna be tempted to listen to what I have to say and think, that was kinda cool, but it won't work for my organization. It won't work for me. And before I make a passionate plea to keep you from flipping tabs to check your Gmail while I'm up here talking, let me just say, you're right, this won't work for you. And speaking of Gmail, regardless of whether you use it or not, it has had a huge impact on our culture. Couple that with things like Google Maps and Google News, and you'd be hard pressed to argue that Google hasn't revolutionized the way that we interact with each other and the world around us on a minute by minute basis. But amazingly, none of the tools that I just mentioned started as main product areas. They didn't flow out of the boardroom. They weren't mandated as the wave of the future by senior leadership. They started organically within the company as part of Google's 20% time. Google leadership offers their employees 20% of their time to do whatever they wanna do, complete freedom. And out of that freedom has come a revolution in information technology that's changed the way each of us lives our daily lives. Alternatively, in the Air Force, we are in a time when senior leadership is mandating that we take a more creative approach to science and technology. We hear that we need to take smarter risks, to understand the boundaries of science and engineering better, to try things differently, to fail, learn, and grow in a way that affects change for our nation's warfighter. And that is a great message to hear. And it's necessary but it's not sufficient. Without the drive at the lower levels of the organization to take those words, put them into action, and organically build up a culture of innovation, the vision of senior leadership will be relegated to buzzwords. Now, in my branch, we tried to meet that call. We brought together our leadership team to take a small step in the right direction. We gave every member of the branch the equivalent of two weeks of their time throughout the year to work on whatever they wanted to work on, complete freedom. Time to be free from the shackles of government bureaucracy. And let me tell you what happened. Nothing. Okay, 
Very little. While the idea was good in theory, it was very challenging for our scientists and engineers to break away from the daily grind of meetings and emails and administrative burdens, and oh, by the way, doing research for their main projects. But the core idea was good. We just had to figure out a way to implement it. Luckily, while reading the book Drive by Daniel Pink, I ran across an anecdote that gave us the spark we needed. The story was about an Australian software company called Atlassian that started an initiative called FedEx Days. Every quarter, employees were given 24 hours to work on something outside of their regular job. Similar to Google, this had resulted in a large number of new ideas and product areas. And they called it FedEx Days because employees were asked to deliver something overnight. Now, in my branch, an all-night work party would have been a bit of a hard sell. So I decided to update the idea for a little bit of public sector flavor and said, if FedEx can deliver something overnight, Postal Service can deliver it in three to five days. So we decided to consolidate this set-aside discovery time into a single week, a discovery down week. We told the branch that we were gonna shut down for four days. And during that time, you can work on whatever you want, with whomever you want, complete freedom. As you can imagine, some people had some concerns. Do you really think that we can do this? What am I gonna do about all those missed meetings and emails? Well, I know so-and-so, and he's not gonna do anything if you give him free time. And that was just from inside the branch. Outside, we heard things like, how can you not support us for a week? And they're just wasting their time out there. Free range may work for chickens, but it does not work for scientists. Maybe you've heard things like this when you try to do something a little different? Well, we heard it all, but we believed in the value this week could provide and press forward. We gave the best top cover we could to our employees. We made it clear they weren't responsible for meetings or emails. We defended them when overly aggressive customers came in demanding support. And we even sent an email to the whole organization that said, we are shut down for the week. And what happened? We got a lot of failures, but we got a lot of really cool stuff too. We were able to do things like identify new features in our explosive materials that fundamentally changed the way we thought about them. We were able to design, produce, and implement a camera system that allowed for real-time monitoring of our processing operations. And we were able to prove that we could draw our branch logo on a piece of explosive material 50 times smaller than a human hair. Ideas like this resulted in new technical thrusts and a flurry of patents. But we encouraged everyone to participate. Not just our scientists, but our technicians, our support staff, even the leadership team got involved. Because of that, we also developed more efficient, common sense processes. We were able to improve our test capability to allow us to collect more data per test and safely expose our materials to more extreme environments. But maybe the greatest thing to happen was the spark of freedom in the workforce. Where there were glazed eyes, now there were wheels turning. Because everyone saw that the world is not going to end if you don't check your email for four days. And everyone will get over the fact that you missed that meeting. And nobody got a bad performance report because they weren't doing their job. Now, here's the part I was warning you about. You're probably sitting back in your chair thinking to yourself, well, that was a great story, but you don't understand, John Henry. Maybe you can shut down for a week, but we can't. We're too busy. We have customers. Our facilities aren't set up for that. Or how about this one? I work from home now. I can't even get my Zoom to stop showing me as a cat. I am not a cat. <laughs> or the saddest one, my boss would never let me do that. So that's a great idea, but that's all it is, and I'm going to put it over here on the idea shelf. And the thing about that is, you're right. First, that it's a great idea, but also that you can't do what we did. That's the beauty of it. Senior leadership can't dictate innovation, and I can't stand up here on this stage and dictate innovation. There is no prescribed one-size-fits-all solution. The events of this past year have only made that point stronger. We didn't take 20% of our time like Google does, and we didn't focus on overnight delivery like Atlassian, but we took key tenets of each of them and applied it to what we know about our organization to make it successful. Likewise, you can take these principles and use them to organically build up your culture. Each of us has a responsibility to build that culture in our organization. Maybe you can't do a week. Can you do a day, a morning, an afternoon? What would your people respond to? You know how you can take this idea and adjust it and shift it and tweak it to make it yours. In fact, I bet you're already thinking about a way you can do that right now. If you're an employee here today, I challenge you to come up with an idea to pitch to your leadership. A way you can help your organization do something like this to shake things up. To come up with new processes that save time and money. New technologies and products that reshape your competitive advantage. 
and new ways for your organization to affect the world around you. And if you're a leader, when your employees come to you with those ideas, support them. Don't just go along with it. Permission is not enough. Protect them. Provide them the top cover they need to be successful. Leadership can kill so many great ideas, but they can enable more. We have the massive responsibility as leaders to set those environments and help our folks grow. Because nobody at Google said, let's go do this email thing. It bubbled up from the bottom. And it's that synergy where the culture rises up to meet the top-down directives of senior leadership where you get true change and true impact. Here's the deal. Each of us can change the world around us. In fact, we already are, regardless of what we're doing. The future is here, sitting in this room and watching online. The future of the lab, of the Air Force, the education system, your company, your community, your church, it's all here. Each of us has a mandate to enable ourselves and our organizations to provide the best future we can. One that keeps the fight unfair. One that uses digital twins and sustainability practices to break through the inertia of the acquisition process. One that brings the rotating detonation rocket engine and conversationally fluent machines to the warfighter quickly and effectively. One that saves the lives of American crewmen and Afghani goats. Whatever your niche is, you have the ability to make the world a better place in a meaningful way. You just have to step up and give yourself and your team the opportunity to fly with complete freedom. Well, at the top of the speech, John Henry did mention that certain words once repeated enough can lose meaning. But his innovative approach to constructive free time, I think, breathes new life into it. So thank you. And I have a new problem. So I want to make sure today that we thank everyone who took part. But before that, everything we saw today, all the speakers, pre-recorded sessions, everything really underpins what AFRL Inspire is all about. That resiliency, that teamwork, that ingenuity that makes it all possible. It makes it all worth it. So starting off the list, I want to thank everyone who took part in the audience today. People sitting here, people watching online. I mean, look to your left, look to your right, look through that screen, and see all the people you work with every day, or new faces. Because of them, we made this all possible, we couldn't thank you enough. Now, while we can accomplish things alone, we are so much stronger together. And second, we want to thank everybody who took part in making this happen. People working the booth, connecting things online, making sure the stage was set, and orchestrating all of this. You're amazing people, and they deserve a round of applause, so please. So truly incredible people. And of course, we want to thank the speakers themselves and the coaches who helped them get to this point. Because of your amazing dedication and the amount of time you spent getting this ready, you made today truly magical. So a round of applause. <laughs> and I want to thank you all on behalf of AFRL's Inspire Committee and everyone here for taking part today. It means so much. We worked so hard. It was just great to take part. So now for some final closing remarks, please welcome back to the stage our Commander, Brigadier General, Heather Prinkle. Well, how awesome was that? Can you hear me? I just knocked this while I was walking up here. I was just so impressed. I don't want this to end, Kenneth. I wanted to keep going on and on. I have to say it was well worth the wait of a year. Truly hats off to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for your efforts and for making today so special and so memorable. Your expertise is truly eye-watering. Uh, I, I am just honored to be a part of this team. But the one thing that stands out so much above and beyond every Every tidbit that I learned, every laugh that I had, a little bit of a tear once in a while, in some of the stories, is the passion. Each and every member of the AFRL team, whether you're supporting the Air Force or the Space Force or both forces, the passion that you have for what you do, the work and the effort and the behind the scenes, it all makes a difference, and we are counting on you. The warfighters are counting on you. Airmen and guardians are counting on you. So thank you for what you do each and every day. Thank you for being a part of this amazing event, and let's do it again next year. Have a great day.